Rent of Land, Karl Marx, 1844. The right of land ownership has its source in robbery. Landlords, like all other men, love to reap where they never sowed and demand a rent even for the natural produce of land. The rent of land, it may be thought, is frequently no more than a reasonable profit or interest for the stock laid out by the landlord upon its improvement. This, no doubt, may be partly the case upon some occasions. The landlord demands a rent even for unimproved land, and the supposed interest or profit upon the expense of improvement is generally in addition to this original rent. Those improvements, besides, are not always made by the stock of the landlord, but sometimes by that of the tenant. When the lease becomes renewed, however, the landlord commonly demands the same augmentation of rent as if they had been all made by his own. He sometimes demands rent for what is altogether incapable of human improvement. Smith gives an example of this latter case, kelp, a species of seaweed, which, when burnt, yields an alkaline salt useful for making glass, soap, etc. It grows in several parts of Great Britain, especially in Scotland, but only upon rocks which lie within the high water mark, which are covered by the sea twice a day, and of which the produce, therefore, was never augmented by human industry. The landlord of such a kelp shore, however, demands a rent for it just as much as for his cornfield. In the neighborhood of the islands of Shetland, the sea is uncommonly abundant in fish. A large part of their inhabitants live by fishing. But in order to profit by the produce of the sea, they must have a habitation upon the neighboring land. The rent of the landlord is in proportion, not to what the farmer can make by the land, but what he can make both by the land and by the sea. This rent may be considered as the produce of those powers of nature, the use of which the landlord lends to the farmer. It is greater or smaller according to the supposed extent of those powers, or, in other words, according to the supposed natural or improved fertility of the land. It is the work of nature which remains after deducting or compensating everything which can be regarded as the work of man. The rent of land, therefore, considered as the price paid for the use of land, is naturally a monopoly price. It is not at all proportioned to what the landlord may have laid out upon the improvement of the land, or to what he can afford to take, but to what the former can afford to give. They, the proprietors of land, are the only one of the three orders whose revenue costs neither labor nor care but comes to them, as it were, of its own accord, and independent of any plan or project of their own. We have already learnt that the amount of rent depends upon, depends upon the degree of fertility of the land. Another factor in its determination is situation. The rent of land not only varies with its fertility, whatever be its produce, but with its situation, whatever be its fertility. The produce of land, mines, and fisheries when their natural fertility is equal, is in proportion to the extent and proper application of the capitals employed about them. When the capitals are equal and equally well applied, it is in proportion to their natural fertility. These propositions of Smith are important because they relate the rent of land given equal cost of production and capital of equal size to the greater or lesser fertility of the soil. Thus they show clearly the perversion of concepts in political economy, which transforms the fertility of the soil into an attribute of the landowner. But let us now examine the rent of land as it is determined in real life. The rent of land is established by the struggle between tenant and landlord. In all political economy, we find that the hostile opposition of interests, struggle and warfare, are recognized as the basis of social organization. Let us now see what are the relations between landlord and tenant. In adjusting the terms of the lease, the landlord endeavors to leave him no greater share of the produce than what is sufficient to keep up the stock from which he furnishes his seed, pays the labor, and purchases and maintains the cattle or other instruments of husbandry, together with the ordinary profits of farming stock in the neighborhood. This is evidently the smallest share with which the tenant can content himself without being a loser and the landlord seldom means to leave him any more. Whatever part of the produce, or what is the same thing, whatever part of its price is over and above this share, he naturally endeavors to reserve himself as the rent of his land, which is evidently the highest the tenant can afford to pay in the actual circumstances of the land. This portion may still be considered as the natural rent of land, 
or the rent for which it is naturally meant that land should for the most part be let. The landlords, observes Say, operate a particular kind of monopoly against the tenants. The demand for their commodity, the land, can go on expanding indefinitely, but there is only a limited amount of their commodity. The bargain struck between landlord and tenant is always as advantageous as possible to the former. Besides the advantage which the landlord derives from the nature of the case, he derives a further advantage from his position, which gives him a larger fortune and sometimes greater credit and standing. But the first by itself is enough to ensure that he will always be able to profit from the favorable situation of the land. The opening of a canal or a road, the increase of population and the prosperity of a district, always the raise of rent. Indeed, the tenant himself may improve the land at his own expense but he only enjoys the profit from this capital for the duration of the lease, on the expiry of which, since the capital cannot be removed, it remains with the landowner. Thereafter, it is the latter who reaps the interest without having made the outlay, for there is now a proportionate increase in the rent. Rent, considered as the price paid for the use of land, is naturally the highest which the tenant can afford to pay in the actual circumstances of the land. The rent of an estate above ground commonly amounts to what is supposed to be a third of the gross produce, and it is generally a rent certain and independent of the occasional variations in the crop. Rent is seldom less than a fourth, and frequently more than a third of the whole produce. Rent cannot be paid in the case of all commodities. For example, in many districts, no rent is paid for building stone. Such parts only of the produce of land can commonly be bought to the market of which the ordinary price is sufficient to replace the stock which must be employed in bringing them th thither together with its ordinary profits. If the ordinary price is more than this, the surplus part of it will naturally go to the rent of land. If it is not more, though the commodity may be brought to the, may be brought to the market, it can afford no rent to the landlord. Whether the price is or is not more depends upon the demand. Rent, it is to be observed, therefore enters into the composition of the price of commodities in a different way from wages and profit. High or low wages and profit are the cause of high or low price. High or low rent is the effect of it. Among the products which always afford a rent is food. As men, like all other animals, naturally multiply in proportion to the means of their subsistence, food is always more or less in demand. It can always purchase a command or command a greater or smaller quantity of labor, and somebody can always be found who is willing to do something in order to obtain it. The quality of labor indeed, which it can purchase, is not always equal to what it could maintain, if managed in the most economical manner on account of the high wages which are sometimes given to labor. But it can always purchase such a quantity of labor as it can maintain, according to the rate at which that sort of labor is commonly maintained in the neighborhood. But land, in almost any situation, produces a greater quantity of food than what is sufficient to maintain all the labor necessary for bringing it to the market in the most liberal way in which that labor is ever maintained. The surplus, too, is always more than sufficient to replace the stock which, is, which employed that labor together with its profits. Something, therefore, always remains for a rent to the landlord. Food is, in this manner, not, the, not only the original source of rent, but every other part of the produce of land, which afterwards affords rent, derives that part of its value from the improvement of the powers of labor and producing food by the means of the improvement and cultivation of land. Human food seems to be the only produce of land which always and necessarily affords a rent to the landlord. Countries are populous not in proportion to the number of people whom their produce can clothe and lodge, but in proportion to that of those whom it can feed. After food, clothing, and lodging are the two great wants of mankind. They usually afford a rent, but not necessarily and invariably. Let us now see how the landlord exploits everything which benefits society. 1. The rent of land increases with increasing population. 2. We have already learnt from Say how the rent of land increases with the buildings of railways, etc., and with the improvement, security, and multiplication of the means of communication. 3. Every improvement in the circumstances of the society tends to either directly or indirectly to raise the real rent of land, to increase the real wealth of the landlord, 
his power of purchasing the labor or the produce of the labor of other people. The extension of improvement and cultivation tends to raise it directly. The landlord's share of the produce necessarily increases with the increase of the produce. That rise in the real price of those parts of the rude produce of land, the rise in the price of cattle, for example, tends to to raise the rent of land directly, and still, and in still a greater portion. The real value of the landlord's share, his real command of the labor of other people, not only arises with the real value of the produce, but the proportion of his share to the whole produce rises with it. That produce, after the rise in its real price, requires no more labor to, co excuse me, to collect it than before. A smaller proportion of it will, therefore, be sufficient to replace with ordinary profit the stock which employs that labor. A greater proportion of it must, consequently, belong to the landlord. The demand for raw products and, therefore, the rise in their value may result in part from the increase of population and the increase in their needs. But every new invention, every new application and manufacture of a hitherto unused or little used raw material increases the rent of the land. Thus, for example, there was a tremendous rise in the rent of coal mines with the advent of the railways, steamships, etc. Besides this advantage which, which the landlord derives from manufacture, discoveries, and labor, there is another that we shall see presently. 4. All those improvements in the productive powers of labor which tend directly to reduce the real price of manufactures tend indirectly to raise the real rent of land. The landlord exchanges that part of his rude produce which is over and above his own consumption or what comes to the same thing, the price of that part of it from manufactured produce. Whatever reduces the real price of the latter raises that of the former. An equal quantity of the former becomes thereby equivalent to a greater quantity of the latter, and the landlord is enabled to purchase a greater quantity of the conveniences, ornaments, or luxuries which he has occasion for. It is absurd to conclude, however, as Smith does, that since the landlord exploits everything which benefits society, the interest of the landlord is always identical with that of society. In the economic system, under the domination of private property, the interest which an individual has in society is in exactly inverse proportion to the interest which society has in him, just as the interest of the money lender in the spendthrift is by no means identical with the interest of the spendthrift. We mention only in passing the landlord's obsession with monopoly directed against the landed property of foreign countries, from which the corn laws, for instance, derive. Equally, we pass over here medieval serfdom, slavery in the colonies, and the miserable conditions of the rural populations, the day laborers in Great Britain. Let us confine ourselves to the propositions of political economy itself. 1. The interest of the landlord in the well-being of society means, according to the principles of political economy, that he is interested in the growth of population and production, in the increase of needs, in short, the increase of wealth. And the increase of wealth is, according to our previous observations, identical with the increase of misery and enslavement. The developing relationship between rent and misery is an example of the landlord's interest in society. For with the increase in rent, the ground rent, the interest on the land on which the house stands, also rises. 2. According to the economists themselves, the interest of the landowner is bitterly opposed to the interest of the tenant, and hence to a large section of society. 3. Since the landowner can demand more rent from the tenant, the less the latter pays in wages, and since the tenant reduces wages more the more rent the landowner demands, the interest of the landowner is just as bitterly opposed to the interest of the agricultural laborers as it is the interest of the manufacturer to that of his workers. It forces wages down to a minimum. 4. Since a real reduction in the price of manufactured goods increases the rent of land, the landowner has a direct interest in depressing the wages of individual industrial workers in the growth of competition between capitalists in overproduction in industrial misery. 5. Thus, the interest of the landowner, far from being identical with that of society, is bitterly opposed to the interests of the tenants, the agricultural laborers, the industrial workers, and the capitalists and the interest of, the of one landowner is not even identical with that of another. One account of competition, which we now have to consider. In general, large landed property and small landed property stand in the same relation to each other as do large capital and small capital, 
There are, however, special circumstances which bring about directly the accumulation of large landed property and thereby the circumscription of small property. 1. Nowhere does the number of workers and implements diminish so greatly in relation to the size of the funds employed as in the case of landed property. And nowhere does the possibility of many-sided exploitation, the saving of costs of production, and the rational division of labor increase proportionately more than with the size of the funds employed. A plot of land may be as small as you like, but the implements required, plow, saw, etc., have a limit below which they cannot be reduced, which there is no limit to the reduction in size of the plot. 2. Large landed property accumulates the interest, which is the tenant's capital, which the tenant's capital has produced by improving the land and the soil. Small landed property has to use its own capital, and this particular profit disappears. 3. Whereas every improvement in society benefits the largest state, it harms the smallest state, since it makes necessary a larger supply of ready cash. 4. There are two further laws to this of this competition to consider. A. The rent of the cultivated land, of which the produce is human food, regulates the rent of the greater part of the other cultivated land. In the last resort, only the largest state can produce food such as cattle, etc. It can, therefore, determine the rent of other land and reduce it to a minimum. The small landowner who works on his own account stands, therefore, in the same relation to the large landowner as does the artisan who possesses his own tools to the factory owner. The small estate has become merely a tool. For the small landowner, rent of land disappears entirely, and there remains, at most, the interest on his capital and the wages of his labor, since rent can be depressed to such an extent by competition that it becomes no more than the interest on capital which is not invested by the owner himself. B. Furthermore, we have already seen that given equal fertility and equal efficient exploitation of the lands, mines, and fisheries, the produce is proportionate to the amount of capital employed. Thus, the victory of the large landowner. Similarly, where equal amounts of capital are employed, the produce is proportionate to fertility. Where capitalists are equal, the owner of the more fertile land triumphs. C. The most fertile coal mine, too, regulates the price of coals at all the other mines in its neighborhood. Both the, propriety, both the proprietor and the undertaker of the work find the one that he can get a greater rent, the other that he can get a greater profit by somewhat underselling all their neighbors. Their neighbors are soon obliged to sell at the same price, though they cannot so well afford it, and though it always diminishes and sometimes takes, al takes away altogether both their rent and their profit. Some works are abandoned altogether, others can afford no rent, and can be wrought only by the proprietor. After, after the discovery of the mines of Peru, the silver mines of Europe were, the greater part of them, abandoned. This was the case, too, with the ancient mines of Peru, after the discovery of those of Potosi. What Smith says here about the mines is more or less valid for landed property in general. D. The ordinary market price of land, it is to be observed, depends everywhere upon the ordinary market rate of interest. If the rent of land should fall short of the interest of money by a greater difference, nobody would buy land, which would soon reduce its ordinary price. On the contrary, if the advantages should, should much more than compensate the difference, everybody would buy land, which would soon raise its ordinary price. It follows from this relation between rent of land and interest on money that rent must continue to decrease until finally only the wealthiest people can live on rent. Hence, the competition between landowners who do not lease their land to tenants increases. Some of the landowners are ruined, and there is further accumulation of large landed property. This competition has the further consequence that a large part of landed property falls into the hands of capitalists who then become landed proprietors, while the small landowners, smaller landowners, generally speaking, are already nothing but capitalists. Thus, a part of large landed property becomes industrial property. The final result is, therefore, the abolition of the distinction between capitalist and landowner, so that, broadly speaking, there remains only two classes in the population, the working class and the capitalist class. The disposal of landed property and the transformation of land into a commodity is the final ruin of the old aristocracy and the complete triumph of the aristocracy of money. 1. 
Romantici romanticism sheds many sentimental tears over this event, but we shall not do so. Romanticism always confuses the infamy involved in this disposal of land with the wholly reasonable and within the system of private property necessary and desirable consequences of the disposal of landed property. In the first place, feudal landed property is already essentially land which has been disposed of, alienated from men, and now confronting them in the shape of a few great lords. Already in feudal land ownership, the ownership of the soil appears as an alien power ruling over men. The serf is the product of the land. In the same way, the heir, the firstborn son, belongs to the land. It inherits him. The rule of private property begins with the ownership of land, which is its basis. But in feudal land ownership, the lord appears at least as king of the land. Therefore, there is the appearance of a more intimate connection between the owner and the land than is the case in the possession of mere wealth. Landed property assumes an individual character with its lord, has its own status, is knightly or baronial with him, has its privileges, its jurisdiction, its political rights, etc. It appears as the inorganic body of its lord, hence the adage, nulla terre sans maitre, in which the joint growth of lordship and landed property is expressed. The rule of landed property does not, therefore, appear as the direct rule of capital. Its dependents stand to it more in the relation of which they stand to their fatherland. It is a narrow kind of nationality. Feudal landed property gives its name to its lord, as a kingdom gives its name to a king. His family history, the history of his house, etc., all of this makes the landed property individual to him, makes it formally belong to a house, to a person. Similarly, the workers on the estate are not in the condition of day laborers, but are partly the property of the Lord, as in the case of serfs, and partly stand in relation to him, and partly stand to him in relations of respect, subordination, and duty. His relation to them is therefore directly political and has even an agreeable side. Customs and character differ from one estate to another and seem to be in harmony with the type of land, whereas later only a man's pocket not his character or individuality, attracts him to an estate. Finally, the Lord does not try to extract the maximum profit from his estate. He rather consumes what is there and tranquilly leaves the care of prote uh, producing it to the serfs and tenant farmers. That is the aristocratic condition of land ownership which reflects a romantic glory upon its lords. It is inevitable that this appearance should be abolished, that landed property, the root of private property, should be drawn completely into the movement of private property and become a commodity, that the rule of the property owner should appear as the naked rule of private property, of capital, dissociated from all political coloring, that the relation between property owner and worker should be confined to the economic relationship of exploiter and exploited, that all personal relationships between the property owner and his property should cease, and the latter should become purely material wealth, that in place of the honorable marriage with the land there should be a marriage of interest, and the land as well as man himself be reduced to the level of an object of speculation. It is inevitable that the root of landed property, sordid self-interest, should also appear in a cynical form. It is inevitable that immovable monopoly should turn into mobile and restless monopoly, into competition, and that the idle enjoyment of the products of other people's blood and toil should turn into a bustling trade in the same commodity. Finally, it is inevitable that in this competition landed property in the form of capital should manifest its domination over both the working class and the property owners themselves, who are being ruined or advanced by the laws governing the movement of capital. So the medieval adage, nulla terre sans signor, is replaced with the new adage, l'argent n'a pas de maitre, which expresses the complete domination of living men by dead matter. As regards the controversy over the division or non-division of landed property, the following is to be observed. The division of landed property negates the large-scale monopoly of landed property, i.e., it abolishes it, but only by generalizing it. It does not abolish the basis of monopoly, private property. It attacks the existence, but not the real essence, of monopoly, and, in consequence, it falls victims to the laws of a private property. For the division of landed property corresponds to the movement of competition in the industrial sphere. This division of the implements of production and separation of labor, which must carefully be distinguished from the division of labor,
The work is not divided among many individuals, but the same work is carried out by each individual. It is a multiplication of the same kind of work. It does not only bring economic disadvantages, like all competition, it leads to further accumulation. When the division of landed property takes place, therefore, the only alternatives are to return to an even more hateful form of monopoly, or to negate and abolish the division of landed property itself. The latter, of course, is not, however, a return to feudal property, but the abolition of private property in land altogether. The first supersession of monopoly is always an extension and generalization of it. The supersession of monopoly, which has attained its widest and most inclusive existence, is its complete destruction. Association applied to the land has the advantage from an economic point of view of large-scale ownership, while at the same time it realizes the original tendency of the division of land, namely equality. Moreover, association restores the intimate relationships between man and the land in a rational way, instead of through serfdom, overlordship, and a foolish mystique of property. The land ceases to be an object of sordid speculation, and through the freedom of work and enjoyment becomes once more man's real personal property. One great advantage of the division of landed property is that the property of the masses is destroyed in a different way from that of industry, and they are no longer willing to accept serfdom. As for the large estates, their defenders have always sophistically identified the economic advantages of large-scale agricultural production with the existence of large-scale landed property, as if these advantages would not reach their greatest extent and bring social benefits for the first time with the abolition of private property. Similarly, they have attacked the commercial spirit of the small landowners, as though the large estates did not contain this petty trading in germ, even in their feudal form, not to speak of the modern English form in which the feudalism of landlords and the trading of industry of tenant farmers are combined. Just as large landed property can be returned, can return the reproach of monopoly made from the standpoint of small land holdings, since the division of land is also based upon the monopoly of private property, so can the small holdings reject the reproach of having divided the land. For the division of land exists also in the case of large estates, but in an inflexible, crystallized form. Private property, indeed, is everywhere based upon division. Moreover, since the division of landed property leads again to large landed property as capital wealth, feudal property is bound to be divided, or at least fall into the hands of capitalists, however it may twist and turn. For large landed property, as in England, drives the greater part of the industrial population into poverty and reduces its own workers to utter misery. It thus creates and augments the power of its enemies, capital and industry, so far as it thrusts the poor as a whole, and a whole sphere of activity into the other camp. It makes the majority of the country industrial, and thus the enemy of large landed property. Where industry has attained considerable power, as at present in England, it opposes foreign monopolies to that of large landed property, and forces the latter into competition with foreign landed property. Under the rule of industry, landed property could only maintain its feudal dimensions with the help of a, num with the help of a monopoly against foreign countries, in order to protect itself against the universal laws of trade which contradict its feudal nature. Once thrown into the competition, it must conform with the laws of competition like any other commodity which is subject to them. But it becomes thereby so fluctuating, growing and diminishing, passing from hand to hand, that no law can keep it any longer in a few predestined hands. The direct consequence is its fragmentation in many hands, a prey to the power of industrial capital. In the end, large landed property, which has been kept in existence by force and has created alongside itself a formidable industry, leads more rapidly to crisis than does the division of landed property alongside which the power of industry remains in second place. As we can see in England, large landed property has cast off its feudal character and has taken on an interest in industrial character to the extent that it wants to make as much money as possible. It gives the owner the highest possible rent and the tenant farmer the highest possible profit on his capital. Consequently, the agricultural workers are soon reduced to the minimum level of subsistence, and the farmer class establishes the power of industry and capital within landed property. Through competition with foreign countries, the rent of land ceases, in the main, to constitute an independent source of income. A large section of the landowners is obliged to take place of the tenant farmers who sink in this way to the proletariat.
On the other hand, many tenant farmers will acquire landed property for the large landowners who have abandoned themselves to the enjoyment of their comfortable revenues and are usually unfitted for large-scale agricultural management have very often neither the capital nor the experience to exploit the land. Consequently, a section of them is completely ruined. Ultimately, the wages which have already been reduced to a minimum must be further reduced in the face of new competition. And that leads necessarily to revolution. Landed property had to develop in both these ways in order to experience in both of them its inevitable decline. So also industry had to ruin itself both in the form of monopoly and in the form of competition in order to arrive at faith in man.